Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. And today I wanted to talk about a book that I've read recently that I found really quite interesting and engaging for several different reasons. Um, and that is Time Shelter by Georgi Gospodinov, or maybe Georgi, I'm, I'm sure, still not sure. Who knows? Somebody please do correct me. Um, and translated by Angela Rodell. And um, this is one of those books that I sort of picked up partly because I thought it sounded quite interesting, but also as a little bit of an anticipation of the Booker Prize, uh, the International Booker Prize, that is, um, because it, it was one of those books that a few people have been sort of touting as potentially having a shot for the list. And now actually having read it, I see why. I feel like it, it does fall into very Booker territory. And I don't mean that as an insulting thing towards the book. Um, it, it has a lot of the elements that book prizes um, and literary fiction tends to kind of really grab at and, and, and really love in a big way. So, you know, it's a very sweeping book that deals with issues of European history, with philosophy, with um, ideas of memory and reality and what those things really do mean for people. Um, it talks about loads of other aspects that I just found really quite fascinating. It didn't always necessarily fully work for me as a book or, you know, my, my enjoyment and my intellectual enjoyment of the book, I guess, were two slightly different things. Um, although connected. Uh, but uh, I still think a really interesting book nonetheless. Um, and so I'm going to be talking a little bit about it. There will be some spoilers later, but the first part, the majority of this really will be spoiler free. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about this very interesting and very unique little book. So first things first, this book um, as its name suggests, talks a lot about the notions of, of time and what that really means across history. And the the really fantastic and interesting thing, I think, for me was how this book takes a sort of long lens approach at European history and pokes fun in many ways at various things that we have, I suppose, swallowed or kind of perceived as being the true facts or the true things about European history. So it, it kind of pokes fun at the idea of a national character of people. Um, it pokes fun at the idea that there was a golden age for certain countries um, and, and all of those sorts of things. And it, it kind of problematizes all of that through this main character called Gostin. Um, and we're told that Gostin from the beginning is this sort of slightly mythical character who seems in many ways to be traveling through time. But actually the book begins before it begins, if that makes sense. So right at the beginning, um, as you often get in books, you get these sort of epigraphs or kind of quotes from people um, about various things. And then you start to notice that Gostin is is uh, referred to several times throughout this. So for example, uh, no one has yet invented a gas mask and a bomb shelter against time. Gostin, Time Shelter, 1939. The year 1939, obviously European history, quite a big year. Um, and then you also sort of see at one point there is yesterday and yesterday and yesterday. Gostin slash Shakespeare. And this is all before we get to the first pages of this novel. And so I remember reading, because before I started reading the book, I obviously didn't know that the character was called Gostin. And so you start reading and I was like, Gostin, where have I heard that name before? And then flicked back and reread the quotes and was like, OK, cool. So this idea of time, again, has already been complicated from the very beginning of the book. The idea that Gostin's actions have taken place before this book to the extent that he can be a quoted figure talking about things that the book then riffs off. Um, and then also just these ideas that, um, you know, was it Gostin or was it Shakespeare? You know, these sorts of play, this this playfulness with this idea of time and authorship and, and all these other things. Um, and you may wonder what's the point in all of that. And in some ways it, it, it features in the book, in some ways it doesn't. But I think that's kind of the enjoyment of this book is the way that it purposely sets up what you think is probably going to happen in terms of how we talk about time or Europe or history or what, what have you. And it just sort of seems to have fun dancing in the embers of that and sort of trying to work out what was going on instead. So that book, that, that from that kind of intro, we then follow through this, this span of European history with Gostin appearing at various locations. And there's a really great line at one point where, you know, early in the book, we have Gostin doing things like writing from Switzerland or writing from a place. And later in the book, we at one point get him say, oh, I'm just writing from 1941 or whatever the year is. And there's something really funny almost about that 
idea. It's so absurd to our understanding that, you know, you can write back from a time or from a future time um, in that sense. And then, you know, like, oh, I'm just writing from 1941. I'll catch up with you soon. Um, it's sort of this absurdist thing. And, and that absurdity t is throughout the book in a really funny and interesting way. Um, for example, our main character in trying to sort of track down Gostine and try, trying to understand who he is um, also starts to um, have these conversations with people around him or kind of entertain some of these discussions around various things. So with the idea of memory, we have a few characters who um, have sort of Alzheimer's and dementia and there's a real um, discussion within that around memory and loss and, and how we start to, to process that. But we also get um, a few other conversations with people who were sort of stand-ins in many ways for for national characters. Um, and it's going to be hard to talk a little bit more about some of this without going into spoilers. But just before I do drop the spoiler curtain, um, I do think this book is really fascinating. I think um, there's a quote on, on it somewhere from Olga Tokarczuk on the back who talks about putting it on a special shelf in her library that she reserves for books that can never be fully exhausted, books that demand to be revisited every now and then. And I kind of feel like it's one of those books. There's a lot in there that after I finished reading it, I was thinking about um, and realised that there might be a little bit more that's going on behind the scenes. So I do really recommend it. I mean, it's, um, I think, yeah, it was a really interesting book. I think sometimes... I don't know, maybe I, I kind of want to reread it and basically get another another feel for it, but I, I did overall really enjoy it. And with that said, let's go into spoiler territory. So, as mentioned, there are a fair few things in this book that purposely complicate notions of time and nationhood and history and statehood and all of these other things. And um, two main things start to come um, to light as we go through this book. So, one, towards the end, there is a discussion of um, what's the kind of golden age or what's the perfect time for certain countries. And so all of the countries in Europe are given a, a vote, a sort of a, a national referendum for what year, what decade they want to go back to. And so some nations think, well, actually, we had this really great time in the 60s. We should really go back to the 60s. That was a great time for us. Others, it's the 70s or the 80s or, or what have you. But what this then starts to do is create this discussion around, firstly, what does it mean to have a golden age or a good period for a country and for who, right? You know, um, the, the factor that's thrown in is, OK, so uh, th there's a really great passage about sort of saying, well, actually, you know, lots of people are voting based on their memories of nostalgia of a certain period of, say, the 70s. If they vote for the 70s and move everything back to the 70s in whatever absurd um, version that looks like, whether that's sort of deindustrializing or taking away technology or what have you, um, then that works for some people. But then actually suddenly you've got these young children who have been gr who've grown up in one decade and are now being forced to go and live in this completely other decade that isn't theirs in quite the same way. Um, and also, what does that mean for international relationships? And obviously, this is an absurd thing that's thrown up as a as an idea, but it reveals so so much about those discussions that actually, if you are to to say, okay, Finland in the nineteen seventies is this ideal perfect time, well, what happens when ten years later Finland? who've moved back to the 70s are now going into the 80s again. Is this going to be a bad thing? Uh, are they now moving out of this decade? And what does it mean now? What what do years mean anymore if you're back to 1970, but it's really 2022 for everybody else or whatever, or your neighbouring country is 10 years ahead or behind? Um, and there's also just a kind of a funny throwaway line about um, phone companies being really annoyed because uh, people start initially start, start trying to throw away their phones and sort of say we're returning back to the 70s where it was idealist you know it's, it's perfect and, and everything um but then people still want their phones or want to work remotely or or what have you and so phone companies are trying to find ways of skirting around this issue and and stay relevant and lobby government to to you know change the decision um but actually what also starts coming up is the 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 idea of authorship and kind of reality within this because um, Gostin, who we've had all the way through, we're told repeatedly at the beginning his full name is Augustine Garibaldi. 
Um, and it's sort of a compromise between his parents in terms of naming him. But then with him going as Gostin, he's technically Gostin Garibaldi, so GG. And so he starts signing off GG like our author here. And so this again starts throwing it up these ideas of um, of authorship. Is, is Gostin actually real? Is this um, the author having a kind of conversation with himself about his memories and his history does that also play into this idea of, of a fractured memory and how we can never fully really grasp what it means to remember so many really fascinating things start taking place in this book um and i really admired how light touch some of that is i was really worried at the beginning of this book that it would have a real you know 50 pages in it seemed like there might be a fairly strong philosophical bent to a lot of this Book. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I think I was a little bit worried about where that would actually go. But it, actually, as a, as a novel, I found it really still enjoyable, and thought that that uh, the it wears its sort of academic discussions fairly lightly in kind of quite a a parable like way. It reminds me a little bit of um, England, England by Julian Barnes, where. The idea of nationhood and what it really means to have a, a have a culture or a historical status as a country is fairly meaningless sometimes and is often just boiled down to statues. And the way England England does it is through this sort of slightly farcical, absurdist story. And I think in many in many ways the same thing happens here, where we are allowed to go into this slightly magical um, thought experiment. Um, in order to really expose some very strange and interesting ideas about what a nation might think is their their perfect history, and actually how those things are completely unsustainable and un that we, we we chase after them, but they're not really something we can always keep because um, things will change, nations go through ebbs and flows, and actually even the ending of this book talks about. Um, let me get the years right here. It refers to. Um, Sorry, there we go. Um, it refers to 1939 and 2029. Um, obviously, 2029 has not yet happened, um, but 1939 has this big historical relevance in Europe for the start of World War II. And so, this then sort of starts to hint that that almost that quote that um, is sometimes used of history doesn't repeat itself; it merely rhymes. And that sort of is what this book seems to be suggesting. Also, a slightly terrifying future for six years' time at the time of filming this. Um, yeah. So all of that's to say, this is quite a complex book, but I think it wears it fairly lightly. I think it has really intelligent, thoughtful discussions around nationhood and uh, and history and memory and time, but it does so in a way that's fairly enjoyable and, and is a you know, it's something you can sit and read and think and spend time with. So yeah, I, I do really recommend it. And um, the more I'm talking about it, the more I realise how much I actually enjoyed it. I gave it four stars on, on Goodreads. And obviously, starring ratings is a completely different thing. But it, it's hovering between four and five for me, really. It's a, a really solid book. And I think a really interesting one. And I wouldn't be surprised if it does get long listed for the, for the International Booker. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if it gets shortlisted or maybe wins just because um, it's a book that I think would do very, very well on rereadings. Um, so there we go. Anyway, I've been Bother Booker rambling about this book and talking about it way more than I thought I would, actually. I thought this would be about a four minute video. So there we go. <laughs> Take care and speak to you all soon. Bye bye.